Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? Tony, I'm outstanding. My kids are yet again at home. This is at least three shows in the last two weeks where it's been like, yeah, I got to shovel the driveway this morning, and my kids are home from school today. And uh, yeah, we're just living the dream, man. Living the dream. How about you? But Tom, if nobody's leaving, why are you shoveling the driveway? Are you an idiot? Mm. Well, that, that, that is an, always a relevant question, and the answer is quite possibly, because <laughs> it seems like at some point the snow is going to melt. April will get here at some point, and the snow will eventually melt on its own. But yes, I have, I have chosen to just continue, just spend my entire month of February out shoveling the driveway. I've shoveled the driveway more in the last week than I have in several entire winters since we've lived here. So yes, it is, uh, it is quite a time to be alive. And the problem right now is it's so consistently cold, and it's not going to be melting temperature and prob- until probably march which just means it, it's not going anywhere so yes tom you're right you have to uh keep up with it or else you're just like if you let it go a day it freezes and then now you're shoveling snow on top of ice which mm-hmm. you know, so yes looked at the just looked at the 10-day forecast and we're getting above freezing once uh a week from now and it will be 34 that day so should this snow should all be gone very very soon should be fine 34 hit the beach mm-hmm so uh tom let's do the podcast Mm, let's do that because that's what we're doing right now and the thing is um there's not a lot of stuff going on but there has been some movement on the osu uh, i'd say coaching staff because all of these guys are considered coaches in some form or fashion ohio state uh, has brought in a couple of analysts paul rhodes a qc analyst Mm -hmm. for the ohio state defense and Todd Fitch, a QC analyst for the Ohio State offense. The uh, Ohio State has not announced any of this. These are guys that have just um, you know, popped up on the, the OSU uh, staff directory. So we know it's happened. We know, and, and plus, of course, sources indicating that these guys are coming. And, you know, I, I don't even know if Ohio State will announce anything because this is something that Ohio State doesn't really usually talk about because. QC guys are so low on the totem pole that really all you're going to get is uh, like releases on actual assistant coaches, like one of the 10 assistant coaches, maybe a a strength coach, maybe a guy like CJ Barnett replacing Ryan Stamper. I would expect we would get something like that. I don't know that we would get anything about Fitch or Rhodes specifically. We might get those two guys mentioned when Ohio State does the release about CJ Barnett replacing Ryan Stamper, assuming they're going to get one. But it is interesting to me that this isn't even something that would necessarily be on Ohio State's radar in terms of media, but it's something that this beat is so like you have to dig so deep to there there's you have three hundred and sixty five days to occupy in terms of coverage. and i I just wonder how many other beats are you know breaking down q c guys nationally, Tom. Probably not a whole lot would be my guess. And, you know, this is one of those things that in some ways, this is something that people care about because of the names involved. I mean, Ohio State has quality control guys every year. It's news when Alabama hires Doug Marone because he was an NFL coach and he was a head coach of of Syracuse. And, you know, it's news when you bring in a name. The last QC guy who I think most people might remember at Ohio State was Joker Phillips, and that's because he was a former Kentucky head coach. And that was a number of years ago now. They have these guys every year. This year, it's getting a little more tension because it's like, oh, I remember Paul Rhodes when he was the, uh, you know, what was the big locker room speech, the big impassioned locker room speech at Iowa State. So damn proud of you guys. And, uh, you know, people probably remember him from that. And, um, you know, it's a little bit more of a name. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, this is this is these are not folks who go out on the road at all in terms of recruiting. They're not folks who are going to be, you know, like you're not necessarily going to see these guys uh, standing on the sidelines screaming in headsets on uh, on game days on Saturdays. These are kind of like the, the the you know little little parts of the machine who you don't you know you don't necessarily see, but they end up being a pretty important part of what you can do inside the program uh, and you know being being prepared for stuff uh, during the year, you know handling handling all the crap that the regular you know the main top ten assistant coaches don't necessarily have time to do while they're doing all the other pieces of their job. Which is so amazing when you think back uh, to the television show Coach. What 
they could do with a three person staff. You had mm -hmm. head coach, offensive coordinator, and defensive coordinator. And they built that Minnesota State into a power. Mm -hmm. And now today, coaches are so soft. They're like, oh, I need 15. It's like Nick Saban is the softest guy around. I need 22 quality control guys. And they all have to be head coaches because I don't know what I'm doing. It makes me sick. <laughs> Not one of them keep his daughter from tweeting, though. So, <laughs> But uh, Paul Rhodes didn't begin his career at Ohio State, but his second stop was a GA at Ohio State in 1991, 30-odd years ago. Was Tom Herman's head coach at Iowa State for a spell before Ohio State grabbed him? So there's a, you know, maybe, maybe they got the Tom Herman recommendation. I know Urban Meyer has talked about Paul Rhodes before as well as being a guy that he, he liked. So there, there is that also. Um, Paul Rhodes being at UCLA as DB's coach 2018, 2019 with Chip Kelly. You know, Chip Kelly and Ryan, Ryan Day are very close. And so there's, there's a lot of, um, back and forth there and here and the what seven years as head coach at Iowa state just gives the guy a, a bunch of different. Um, like, remember when Greg Shiano was said, you know, I know what it's like to be a head coach head coach. So I know what head coaches need, like what, like the best way to serve head coaches. And I think they get that with Paul Rhodes, even though, you know, as an analyst, you're QC guy, you're, you're supposed to look at just one of these specific things, but still, they know what the head coaches are looking for because it's stuff they've all they've all asked for before. So I think that that certainly helps, as you were saying. Well, yeah, having someone else who you can just kind of turn to who's just sort of been the veteran guy who's been around a little bit like that, that has to help. I mean, Ryan Day at this point, you know, this is now he's going into his third year as the full time head coach. So, OK, this is not a new thing for him anymore. But just having someone else who, you know, think of it as the uh, whatever, the hand of the king in uh, Game of Thrones, like someone else to just sort of like, hey, someone else who's been, you know has time to think about the stuff that you don't necessarily have time to think about or who has been in that position where they've had to kind of make some of these decisions before. And you can, you can lean on that person in, in some ways for things that you might not be able to ask other people, you know, about if they haven't been in that same position. So yeah, it's, it's just, this is one of these things that is a, it's a little bit of a market inefficiency because there's some, there's obvious value in having these folks around, but there are also a lot of programs that probably don't have the, ability to pay for them so it's you know your your scholarship cap to 85 you can't bring it you know use use all of your uh, extra resources as ohio state to bring in another 20 guys but uh, you know in terms of scholarship players but you can bring in some extra you know bring in some extra brain power bring in some extra folks to you know maybe you know maybe this is just like hey uh penn state really chewed up our defense last year uh you know with with the rpos in the second half like what can we do to change, you know, what can we do to, to, you know, solve that this fall, Paul, go figure that out. And then Paul Rhodes goes back to his office and spends weeks grinding film or calling the people he knows to talk about how they've, you know, I mean, pick, pick people's brains on stuff. Like it's stuff that you don't necessarily have time to do. If you're Kerry Combs to focus on like this one thing put for, you know, a, a long-term project, but just kind of go, okay, go do this, solve that problem, get back to me. And, and, you know, that, that's something that you, you typically see quality control coaches do, like projects like that, a lot of self-scouting, uh, you know, identifying what you are doing in certain positions, identifying, you know, trends and tendencies in, in your own offense and, and uh, figuring out, like, how will teams attack this? And so, you know, so you get into the I know that you know that I know that you know kind of thing. So, yeah, there's just, again, like, this is not something that is necessarily – He's not someone whose name is necessarily going to come up during a bunch of post-game press conferences next year when they're talking about why something went really well, but it's possible that he will be the reason, you know, the reason behind, you know, a, a problem that they solved at some point. Well, like we've talked about before with uh, Parker Fleming and the, the onside kick, where mm -hmm. generally, yeah, 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 where, um, yes, it'll be, it'll be for good reasons. <laughs> you mm -hmm. Imagine like Ryan Day throwing somebody under the bus, the QC guy <laughs> under the bus, like, well, we were supposed to self-scout that, but apparently we didn't do well enough. And that person was Paul Rhodes and I am blaming him for that. I would not expect that, uh, especially with this next guy, Todd Fitch, who is QC guy, QC hire for the offense, who coached with Day at Boston College and, and when, when Day was there from you know, 2013, 14, whenever. Also, Fitch is a Bowling Green grad, so he's 
even though he's born in Michigan, once you graduate from Bowling Green, you're an Ohio guy because you've got that Euchre degree. Mm -hmm. You've uh, you've oped a thousand times, a thousand hours of ope. You know, mm -hmm. we, we know that's the, all of that stuff. Tom, you've probably finally acquired that, all of these things uh, as an Ohio and not quite the Euchre though. We know that. So, uh, you know, that's why you still have to travel with a passport. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it is what it is. Um, he is familiar with Ryan Day and the offense. So, I, you know, that's... That's good, but also you've seen some other things. So you do have fresh eyes. And I think that's another reason why churning coaches, not necessarily just churning coaches, that's just the business, the nature of the business. But new guys come in and they look. and Because at that point, you're almost not um, self-scouting yourself. You're just self-scouting anybody. Like, yes, he's self-scouting Ohio State, but to him it's just scouting an opponent or scouting anybody. Like, I'm going to tell you what I see because I, I have nothing else to base this off of. Um, and, and so you get a, some fresh eyes that way, which I, I think helps. And then as he becomes more familiar, then you can do, do other things with him. But uh, you know, it's just another guy was, uh, you know, he, he said, well, you just look up, uh, you know, up and down his, his resume and, and tons of stops, but it has been places for numerous years. Not like Billy Davis, where like, I think his longest stop was maybe two years. You know, and, and that's probably an exaggeration, but it's like you know, the uh, a baseball card of, Bob Boone. It's, it's just like 40 years and, and the boot stayed, you know, in one place too long, but like these utility guys just every year they're somewhere else and they have so many different stops. And that's, uh, that's not quite Todd Fitch, but he's, he's been a lot of places, but he's been there for multiple years, which is good coming from Vanderbilt this past year, where he, he ended up being the offensive coordinator, quarterbacks coach, and then was the interim coach, I think for the, the final game or so. And, uh, he went, Oh, and one time. Failing to win a game at Vanderbilt last year is probably not going to be something I'm going to hold against him too harshly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just just as I won't hold Paul Rhodes being the defensive coordinator at Arizona last year against him too harshly because uh, there may have been some systemic issues that led to uh, that that were beyond his control during his one year in Tucson. Uh, it, yeah, I think his I don't remember if his last game was the Arizona State game, but they lost seventy to seven, oh, and it was like well. Well, if you're losing a rivalry game by 63 points, there are probably some broader cultural issues there that you need to address that are not necessarily directly applicable to the uh, def defensive coordinator and the defensive coordinator only. So, yeah, give, I, think, uh, I think everyone gets a certain amount of a pass for last year uh, regardless. So, yeah, and, and, you know, I think it's an interesting mix where you mentioned the connections between these, these guys and Ryan Day. But they've also gone out and done other stuff. They've been in other programs. They've been in other systems. They've coached in other conferences. They've coached with other st other staffs, and you end up just getting guys who are coming in with some new ideas. Where you know, hey, uh, when a team is running uh, duo, for example, like you know, hey, here's how we tried to defend that at Arizona because the guy who was his linebackers coach at Arizona came from a different program and they did it this way and. So you can have guys come in and just bring in different ideas, different thoughts, kind of workshop stuff, throw some stuff against the wall and see what works in terms of your personnel, in terms of your system and all that. So, yeah, br bringing in some outside perspective is always always probably a good thing. You don't want constant churn on your staff because that's the kind of thing that catches up with you. But if you, you know, if you're replacing a coach or two a year or you're bringing in just outside new analysts who have some different thoughts on how to do things like that's that's actually a good thing. That's. You don't you don't want to be replacing your whole staff, but uh, a little a little fresh blood is probably not a bad not a bad thing. Now, and another Tom Herman connection here tangentially. Fitch was the quarterbacks coach at Iowa State from two thousand four to two thousand six, preceding Tom Herman by about three years. But mm. you know, same school, same position, just a few years earlier. I don't know why I bring him up, but just uh, <laughs> Iowa State is like the cradle of coaches. I don't know if you know <laughs> that, but that's what that's what I call it. I know other people say Miami. I was going to say there may be some folks in Oxford, Ohio, who take umbrage with that, but uh... that's just my opinion. I mean, a lot of coaches have been through Iowa State. Earl Bruce, they also. So that's Gene, three. Gene Chizik. Gene mm -hmm. Chizik. Um, Matt Campbell. That's Matt five. Campbell. Yeah. So mm -hmm. five's a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. So uh, so those are the two big big uh, big hires on the coaching staff. I guess if you want to say that. Um, the addition of C.J. Barnett is now official as well, replacing Ryan Stamper. C.J. Barnett, the former Ohio State safety three-year letter winner, 2009 to 2013, I believe he played, entered in, uh, in, in um, yeah, I think he read 2009. 
really good safety teamed with Christian Bar- Christian Barnett um, for a very good duo. Became a Columbus Police Department uh, Columbus Police Officer in the in the CPD. Then uh, now replacing Stamper, and this is another thing where Ohio State has not announced it. However, TJ Barnett's name is in the directory, and it says Director of Player Development and uh, one other like extracurricular um, something or other. So basically what that role is, as we've said before, and I think we talked about it in the last show, is you're taking over Real Life Wednesdays. You're setting up the job fair, the annual job fair that I don't know if they've been able to have this year or will be able to have. I think it usually ends up around about now, isn't it? Isn't it usually in February? It feels like it's normally about this time of year because you got guys lining up like summer internships and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, that's probably probably about now. And so that's one of the, the duties he'll have as well. And, and basically just... Being another ear for the players. I mean, think about it. This is a guy who, uh, Columbus cop, Ohio State player, came from the Dayton area, knows what it's like to be an Ohio State Buckeye and to be a young, just a young man out there. And so, uh, somebody that they can, the players can relate to. I, I, it will be interesting to see how much time it takes to build that connection. It's not going to be overnight and uh, there's going to be some what's the old jim trestle axiom that kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and so that's one of these things where it's that sort of thing takes time but also you can't really wait on stuff like this like you all have to be active like the players have to be active in in how they utilize cj barnett he has to be active in how he um helps the players and mindful that what what exactly can you do during a pandemic you know and and what can you do you know i I, you can't bring people in we 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 may get to visit the the WAC at some point this year i don't know but there's there's no there's no speakers coming in and and talking to the team in the the team meeting room because i don't even know if the entire team can be in a team meeting room at this point so it's the position itself is going to have to grow back after being trimmed back some. And so we'll see how that goes. But Tom, as we said in the last show, pretty much an ideal fit considering where CJ Barnett is coming from and what they're asking for him, I would think. Exactly. I mean, the, the last guy was a former college football player who turned police officer, who was a former Florida player who then took this job at Florida and then came with Urban Meyer to Ohio State. Well, now you've got a former Ohio State player current police officer taking a job at Ohio State. I mean, it's the fact that he's got the background as an Ohio State player, I think probably pushes fast forward on the, uh, you know, does this guy care? Does this guy know? Does this guy understand what we're going through kind of uh, piece of this, you know, acclimation process? It probably, you know, moves him a few steps down the uh, down the road uh, with that in terms of like, yeah, okay, this guy's this guy probably actually does care about this. This guy probably does know what he's talking about. We probably should pay attention to him. Um, so yes, I think that that will probably, uh, speed that, uh, uh, acclimatization process along a little bit for CJ Barnett, but yeah, it, as we said on the last show, it seems like this is about as natural a fit as you possibly could have come up with. And if you were thinking like, who would be a good fit to replace Ryan Stamper? Like this probably would have been right near the top of the list of people who you would say like, yeah, that, that is someone who probably will fill that if, if Ryan Stamper did a good job. CJ Barnett will probably do a pretty good job filling that role as well. Yeah, and I think as I said on the last show, the 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 infrastructure is there for this job, for this position, and the the the, uh, the connections are already have all been made. It's just you know just keep it going, and so I would expect him to do that. Uh, Al Washington, linebackers coach at Ohio State, still as far as we know, is the linebackers coach at Ohio State. So there are reports out of Tennessee that Tennessee has moved on because Al Washington moved on. I I don't know if this is something Ohio State will announce either, unless there is a, a title change for Al Washington, where uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe Friday you get something from Ohio State. Al Washington has been named, you know, run game coordinator, defensive run game coordinator, and uh, maybe they mention a raise. But really, I mean, it, it's not news if a guy stays, if you're coming at it from Ohio State's perspective. 
Yeah, I, I titled the morning show when I talked about this with Ross Fulton on Wednesday. I titled the morning show something about Al Washington's return. And the first comment was, <laughs> where did he go? He didn't go anywhere. It's like, well, I mean, he almost went somewhere. He he basically went somewhere and then he decided not to go somewhere, which is, you know, it's kind of a return. It's not the true prodigal son story, but it's it's, you know, I mean, kind of went somewhere. So, yeah, this is this is one of these like, well, it's news. It, it was almost really big news and then it wasn't news, but that the fact that it isn't news is still kind of news. So again, this also may to some degree trace back to your earlier qu- comments about uh, the 365 day nature of the uh, Ohio state beat. But you know, this was, this was almost a big concern because if Al Washington leaves, you got a hole in your defensive coaching staff with a guy who I think they probably viewed as a long-term part of this coaching staff. So you got to fill that. Plus, you've got to fill, you know, he's done a heck of a good job recruiting linebackers in the 2022 class. So, okay, how does this impact those guys? And, you know, one of those linebackers, his dad just took an assistant coaching job at another Big Ten school. So you wouldn't, you know, you're not necessarily looking for, I don't think there's any imminent concern about anyone leaving out of that class. But at the same time, you don't want to give anyone a reason to think about leaving. So, you know, this was, this was potentially almost a rather significant story. And then it ended up not being a story. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that the closer you're paying attention to this, the bigger a deal it seems like. Because if you were just sort of asleep or just, you know, didn't have your phone on for 48 hours, you would have no idea. It's just like, yes, Al Washington continues to be the linebackers coach at Ohio State. If you were paying closer attention and followed all the twists and turns along with us on the Ask the Insiders board, it was like, wow, this is almost a really big story in a couple different different ways. So it was uh, quite a quite a fascinating week. Uh, a lot of uh, sound and fury ultimately. Uh, <laughs> resulting in nothing other than maybe a raise yeah i mean it's definitely we can't call it not news because we've been talking about it either here or on the the forum for uh almost a week now maybe weeks but (laughs) i've lost track of all time but it's certainly been something to talk about and when you follow it so closely and you get some real-time updates where at one point he's gone and then like the next morning it's like hold up he, he's not gone yet <laughs> and now it looks like he's staying but people are, are getting angry at that well how come there's been no announcement why won't he just come out and say i'm staying and uh i mean that is always something that people say of coaches like well why don't you just come out and stop you know kill the rumors if you know that way uh we don't have to keep talking about it but also but you know there are times where coaches don't even know what's going on on social media. Trust me. Like um, they may not spend as much time on it as you or I, or especially the the message boards where, Oh, fans are upset on message boards. Is that, I mean, is that really all that unusual? Is, are, are we, you know, having been a, a message board member for most of, yeah, most of my life now, if we do the, do the math, like I've been angry. I've seen other people angry. That's just part of the gig. You know, it's, it's what it is and so uh yeah i think people would be happier if uh we just hey man what you doing what what you gonna be doing and the thing is it's like he could be like i where have i gone Uh, you know i sure i saw on the internet that i've returned from somewhere but i have not gone anywhere um and so that's why i don't even know if Ohio state would make an announcement other than if there's there's a uh a job title change in some form or fashion. And I'm just thinking back to the olden days where it was customary for coaches to talk to other schools. And, and I guess you didn't really lose a lot of sleep over it, but when it's a guy like Al Washington who has recruited as well as he has, although Tom, I'm going to be honest, uh, the linebackers got a lot of criticism. So, it, you know, now they've played better this year, but I, I I seem to remember a lot of criticism of Pete Werner and and Tough Borland and, and the 2019 defense that was really fantastic. But maybe he made them better because really it was the 2018 defense where they they received the most grief. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the linebacker play, the quality of linebacker play, has unquestionably gone up since Al Washington has arrived, and uh, there is a you know. He, you know, you know that you know the old saying that you never want to be the guy that follows the legend. Like Al Washington has definitely not had that be a concern for him at all at Ohio State as the linebackers coach. So that was definitely, you know, I think that was definitely helpful for him in terms of setting him up to look like uh, look like he's 
doing a really good job. And I think for the most part, he's done a really good job. It, there, there have, the linebackers have really not been a big issue. The defense, 2019 defense was pretty darn good overall. The 2020 defense, I mean, there were obviously issues. I don't think linebackers were really a big part of that for the most part. And, you know, when when the linebackers were in a bad spot, a lot of times that was a schematic issue rather than a personnel issue. Like, you can't you can't put a guy in a spot where he's chasing Devontae Smith down the field when he's Devontae Smith probably beats him by three tenths of a second at least, or maybe more in the 40, 40 yard dash. Like that's that's not a linebacker problem, even if the linebacker is there looking like he's at the center of the problem. So yeah, I, I Al Washington is someone who I think has come in and made a very immediate and positive impact both on the field and on the recruiting trail uh for the Buckeyes. And so yeah, if they can if they can keep him around, that's a uh that's a pretty big win. I don't know if it's news, but it's a pretty big win. Um, as far as the defending Devontae Smith, I'll just say, you know, Tom, uh, too soon. <laughs> um, well, it'll take him a while to get there. So by the time he gets there, it won't be too soon. Gosh, dang it, Tom. By the way, I did see a seven-round mock draft from Matt Miller, formerly of Bleacher Report, and he had Tough Borland going a second to last. Hmm. So, almost, irre- almost irrelevant. But almost. Does, but does Mr. Irre- does Mr. Irrelevant still get a uh, not like during a, a pandemic trip to Hawaii or a car or something in general? But yes, not uh, and a parade and um, fame and fortune beyond anybody's wildest dreams. But probably not not last year because that would have you know that was what April. So certainly not last year. Maybe mm-hmm. like you get a, a gift certificate to do all of that stuff. Mm. like post pandemic gift certificate. Yeah. And I just, I just saw uh, there was some kind of arts festival that got canceled in Columbus for the summer. I didn't really pay attention to that, but the jazz and rib fest, Tony, the jazz and rib fest was canceled again this year for downtown Columbus. I don't know if you've gone to that, but that is a delightful summer event. And yeah. uh, it is not happening once again. So that's a, that's a bummer. So Mr. Irrelevant cannot have jazz and or ribs this summer, at least in Columbus. Very sad. I just wonder Hopefully the state fair happens. That'll be, you know, August. Cause that's really the only place to get uh deep fried bacon and cheddar ma- mashed potatoes on a stick that I can find. And I look, I spend all year looking for cows made out of butter and I never, I can <laughs> never find them. And then this one time. Yes. So hopefully stuff starts opening up um, basketball, Tom. Ohio State heading to home to face. <laughs> They've been on the road. <laughs> Ohio State heading nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> like Al Washington, it's news. Ohio State, but actually Ohio State is returning mm-hmm. uh, and, and to face mm-hmm. Indiana. And the last time out, they got like almost nothing mm-hmm. from EJ Liddell. Mm-hmm. Almost nothing from nothing from Justice Suing, like zero points from Justice Suing. And they still went on the road against a very, very good opponent. And that's what we said when, you know, Dwayne Washington has been, Dwayne, Dwayne Washington has been shooting poorly and they are still winning. Uh, that's, that's why I really, really like this team because they have so many guys that can pick up the slack for a guy who isn't scoring and two guys who aren't scoring. Like e, EJ Liddell and Justice Suing have been carrying them of mm-hmm. late. And those two guys go completely flat. And, and it's like, oh, Kyle Young's like, you know, whatever, I'll throw up a career. I, I don't care. I'm here. Dwayne Washington starts hitting shots. You know, Justin Arns continues to do what, what he does. And, um, you know, Seth Towns in limited minutes will give you a six. And it's just, it's, it's an entertaining team to watch because they can do it from a variety of ways. And they can even do it when they're not shooting all that well. And so uh, we'll see what they do this weekend. They should be, should be fine. But, uh, you know, crazy, crazier things have happened. But, Tom, your assessment of the team continues to be fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, they, they have been a really entertaining team to watch. You're exactly right. And I think you hit on there what I what makes them, I think, pretty dangerous for the tournament, which is they don't have like the one guy who is this is the guy. And, you know, in some ways that's bad because you, you want to have the guy who's your go to guy in the in the final minutes. That's that's something that typically is a plus when you're looking at a team's uh, possibility of making the final four or winning the championship. But there just there isn't that guy for Ohio State this year because EJ Liddell, like you mentioned, Justice Suing, both had like really really off nights. You're on the road against Maryland, which isn't fantastic, but it's you know that's not an easy place to win on the road. Two of Ohio State's three leading scores are 
have kind of an off night and then it just and they win and they won fairly comfortably and it was fine and they just they there are so many different guys in this Ohio State team that can beat you that you don't need you know if if your one guy is having an off night and we we have seen that in the past with Ohio State where it's like hey the, the one guy who you're you're counting on to jack up a bunch of threes is just he's not feeling it that night you have to have a plan B because sometimes the shots are just not going to be falling that's just kind of how it goes and Ohio State has so many different guys you can look at I mean I'll just run down the points per game uh, EJ Liddell, uh, Naismith Trophy semifinalist, by the way. Congratulations to EJ Liddell. Uh, 14.9, Dwayne Washington, 14.8. We've seen plenty of off games for him, and he's you know still averaging 14.8 points per game. Justice Sewing, 10.4. Kyle Young, 8.9. CJ Walker, 8.4. Justin Ahrens, 7.2. Zed Key, 6.3. I mean, it's just, and Seth Town, 4.8. Like it's just, and, and any one of those guys on any given night, you feel like, yeah, they could, any of those guys could throw in 12, 15 points on any given night and and not be, you know, you wouldn't go like, wow, where did that come from? Like, it just, you know, th- th- this team feels like you could pretty frequently, you could have four or five guys in that like 10 to 14 point range. And when you're not relying on one guy, it makes you, it kind of, it diversifies your risk a little bit. It's like you don't have all your money in one stock. You're in a little bit of a mutual fund where you've got a little bit more diversified risk. And if one thing goes way down, you're not completely busted. But it also makes you harder to try, harder to defend. I mean, you can't just go, uh, you know, boxing one on the one guy who you know can beat you and, and you know, try and make everyone else beat you. Because just about anyone on this team who's on the floor on any kind of regular basis can beat you. This is That is going to make this team a pretty tough out, I think. And you know, most of the guys are pretty good free throw shooters, the guys who are, who are going to be handling the ball. I mean, C.J. Walker, 56 for 58 from the free throw line right now. Uh, Dwayne Washington, 56 for 64. I mean, these are, you know, 80, 87.5%, 96.5%. I mean, those are the guys who are going to have the ball in their hands. Those are the guys you want to have the ball in their hands because if they put them on the line late in the close game, they're probably going to make those shots. So there's just, there's just a lot here to like uh, about this team. And there's not. You know, there is not that one elite player. There is not, there's not one guy on this team. You're like, yeah, that guy's going to be, you know, make a bunch of NBA all-star games. But it's a pretty darn good team. And it seems like a team that's probably just going to continue to kind of grow and build as, as Chris Holtman uh, continues to build this program. It's, it's like, this is, this is a legit team. That's pretty entertaining. And they complement each other really well. And I know Holtman has said in the past that, that EJ Liddell and Dwayne Washington are both focal points of the opponents now. And so they have to raise their games to and, and appreciate the fact that teams are setting out to stop them. But then as they do that, then it's like, well, other guys are getting free and there are too many guys for you to set out and okay, we've got to make sure we don't, we don't let this guy go off. And then you also have to be aware of Justin Arns. And it's not like you have to set out two guys to stop him, but you have to have one guy stay with him the entire time. And I, I like what Holtman said, he said that creates gravity you know, defensive gravity and it draws people to him, which frees up er- other areas. Now, I do want to say one thing. Uh, yes, Justin Arns is shooting almost 50% from three, but we can't compare him to John Diebler for one particular reason for me is Diebler had incredible range and could pull up on anybody. Arns isn't there yet. We see that the further he gets from the three-point line, the worse his shot gets, and, and he needs, he's got a quick release, but Diebler could just also rise up and shoot from anywhere. So. Personally, we can't we can't put Arns in that boat yet simply because he, he doesn't have Diebler's consistency or his, his range. And now, if you just want to put their toes on the line, go for it. And I'm sure they're both really, really good. But Diebler, for me, is the best that's ever done it at Ohio State in terms of the, the three-point shooting from wherever. So I uh, appreciate Justin Arns, what he does, but people calm down on the, on the Diebler stuff. That's just me, Tom. I like the fact that you, you can't be too complimentary. Yeah, but you know, he's, he's fine, but you know what? He's not yes. literally the best ever at Ohio state in history to do it. No, okay. All right. Mr. That's all Hater. I'm saying. Yeah. Like exactly. Thank you. Uh, and, and with that, I think uh, it's a pretty good opportunity to st- stop the show. And for the week, it's been a very productive week. I could not say more for how productive I have been. Uh, Tom, I assume you've been productive as well. We don't yeah. have time to go into that. <laughs> We're too busy doing stuff. <laughs> too busy trying to end the show. 
So uh, that will do it. Who you got on the morning scoop for Friday? I'm planning on talking some basketball, actually, and uh, I'm planning on having Matt Goldman on. I have to actually text Matt Goldman to find out if Matt Goldman's actually around to do the morning scoop. If not, I'll have Mick Walker on, or if absolutely nothing else works out, I can always have you on. But, you know, I'm I'm hopeful that it won't come to that. <laughs> boy, boy, aren't you? So uh, look forward to that in the morning, as always. Sometimes uh, I, I, I listen to it at 1030 at night when time, you know, drops it. Mm-hmm. So if you're not a morning person, feel free My to fa- do that. My favorite thing is the uh, just the constant string of comments when we drop it on YouTube early because it's like, well, there's no point in making people wait till tomorrow morning. I'll just drop it now. This constant stream of people on YouTube who can't wait to tell me how stupid I am because I'm saying the, the wrong day. Like, what an idiot. He doesn't know. It's, it's still Wednesday, dummy. It's not Thursday yet. You doing this show from Australia, dummy? Yes. That, yes, I am. Tom. Croiky. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to the Skip Morning Scoop, mate. Yes. Oh man, you would be so exhausted by the time, by even with a you know like a twelve minute episode, it'd be like you'd just be so exhausted <laughs> talking like that, just trying to keep the entire act up. Uh, but I do look forward to it. It's going to be a long summer. It is going to be a long summer, mate. <laughs> so uh, certainly look forward to that. If you if you guys uh, are yet members of BuckeyeScoop.com, I would re- recommend it. Bill Green is holding his weekly weekly Thursday chats. That's going on right now. Always tons of information. Ask Bill anything about uh, football ish related would be would be my suggestion. But uh, whatever you like, if you're not yet a member, try it out. I promise you, you'll like it. Tom, that's going to be it for the rest of the week. So uh, thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you guys probably on Tuesday. <laughs>